All right, and we are live. Hello, and welcome to another Launch and Learn with Purse Strings. My name is Maggie Nielsen, and I am a partner here at Purse Strings. Uh, for those who are new, we're all about providing tips, tricks, pieces of advice on how to be financially fearless. And then when you're going through divorce, getting ready for retirement, maybe you need an estate plan, whatever it may be, we have top tier financial professionals willing, ready, and able to serve you. We call those our Purse Strings Approved Professionals, and Tracy is one of them. Um, and so we're so excited to have her on today to talk about getting the biggest settlement in divorce, which I know is usually our goal, I think, um, just besides just getting through it. Um, and so I know this can be a lot, managing all the finances and all those good things. So I'm so excited you're on here today, Tracy, to give some of your amazing insight. Um, but before we dive into that, could you give a little intro of who you are and what you do? I'm a forensic accountant. I find money. I do that in the corporate world where companies have executives who are hiding money or stealing money. But I also do it on the personal side for divorce cases when there are concerns about what's been happening to the finances there. And so I really have a mission of helping women get better financial settlements in their divorces. And when we say getting a bigger financial settlement or better financial settlement, sometimes people think it means that we're trying to do something shady, take something that's not owed to you. That's not it at all. What it is, is I've seen so many women leave money on the table in their divorces because they didn't know enough about what was going on with the money, didn't look hard enough or far enough into what was happening. Their spouses were hiding money that they didn't know about. And so trying to uncover all of those things so that we can have a complete picture of the money and then get that better financial settlement than you would have otherwise. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited to dive into this conversation. I know you're all about finding finding the money um, because that, I mean, that is your full job, which is so interesting to me as well. Um, but if anyone has questions along the way, uh, please throw them in the chat. Happy to help answer those. And if you are watching the replay, you can also throw them in the comments and we'll work on getting back to those. Um, but Tracy, you know, last week we we're talking about divorce as well. And one of the biggest financial mistakes was just throwing in the towel too early. It could be exhausting dealing with all of this. And I'm sure even digging it up, knowing that there's more hidden secrets, it can be a lot. So I'm glad you're here to kind of guide us in this conversation. I am really fired up about throwing in the towel too early because I do believe that in divorces, there will come a point where you need to weigh, is it worth continuing to fight? Divorce can be very difficult emotionally. It can be very expensive. And there'll be a point where you probably are going to say, okay, it's time to stop fighting and, you know, settle. I might not be getting everything that I want, but I've gotten enough. However, what I see women doing a lot is throwing in that towel a little too early. Mm -hmm. You know, I, in some of the online support groups that I am a member of, I see people saying, well, we're going to mediation and he's put forth the settlement offer and he hasn't given up any of the bank statements. And I don't have a full list of all the assets, but I think that what he's giving me for a settlement offer is probably fine. And so I think I'm going to take it. And I want to say, no, 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 please don't, please don't, because if he's not giving you the documents, there's probably a reason why. And there probably yeah. is something hidden. And so, you know, it's not uncommon that, you know, a stay-at-home mom or somebody else, you know, they're managing everything else and they have not had a part in the finances. So this is kind of like, how do I even get started? You know, so like, what do you even recommend there for these people who haven't been looking at the bank statements, don't really know where the accounts are? Right. The first step is starting to get information, gather as much information as you can. One of the things that we um, talk about in the divorce money guide, which is my program for people who need to take control of that financial part of their divorce and figure out what's been going on with the money. We talk about putting together a list of the accounts that you know about, or if you know that we banked at a certain bank, but I don't know what the account number is. I don't know whose name is on the account. That's okay. Put it on your list. Just put the bank name there and we'll start piecing together some information. So it's about starting to figure out where you might have accounts, making lists of what assets you know about, and you'll be surprised. You know more than you think you do. You start a running list work on it over time, you'll be unloading the dishwasher and think of, oh my gosh, I remember we bought, fill in the blank with whatever the valuable asset is. Um, and then start gathering statements. 
So for the bank accounts that you do have legal access to because you know your name is on them, you can get statements for them. You can log into online, online banking. You can go to the bank itself and ask them for statements. Gathering those kinds of things, gathering tax returns is all very, very important. And that's the way you start taking control of it. And I say to people, even if you're overwhelmed and you don't think that you can go through all the bank statements, you don't think that you can understand a tax return, that's okay. Just start by gathering the information. Put it on a pile. We'll figure out what to do with it later. That's a great piece of advice. And I'm, I'm pretty sure if your name is on the account, you can legally always get access. So even if it's a shared account, but you don't have your own username and password, what, you call up the bank, you go to the bank, and they can legally get you your own username and password. Absolutely. You should be able to have a username and password. You should not have to rely on your husband to give you access, give you the password. If for some weird reason your bank says, oh no, only one login is allowed, or for whatever reason, they're not generating a username and password for you, your next step is to, to go to the bank. Literally walk into a bank branch with your identification and tell them, I need statements for this account, and they will give them to you. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. And so once you have these statements, where do you kind of go from there? I mean, it just seems like now you got a big thick pile of papers. Right. So if you're overwhelmed, I just told you, you don't have to necessarily look through them just yet. Just get them first. I'm hoping that you would be willing to take the leap in looking into them. You know, your family, you know, your habits. If you can start looking at the bank statements and the credit card statements and literally just go down them line by line by line, I bet you you're going to see some things that you have questions about. Why was money spent here? You're going to start gathering information. How much is being deposited to the account? You're going to see that paychecks are being deposited. You might happen to notice here's one paycheck that was deposited that seems way too low compared to what the paychecks normally are. And so it's a matter of starting to go through these documents and learn what's in them. I'm sure you've gone through a lot of other people's documents and really have seen it all. Um, I'm sure you have I some have. great stories up in there of just like these random things that you're like, mm, that's a red flag. Sure. I mean, I see things like purchases, you know, um, at at places not local to you, maybe just outside of town. I see a hotel across town, you know, where I, I end up having to say, did you guys go to a hotel maybe for a weekend away or something? And my client says, no, we didn't. And, and then they know that that's suspicious. Um, I might see a lot of cash withdrawals at an ATM machine. And what's interesting about the ATM withdrawals is especially if I'm looking at statements that go back for a year or two and there weren't a lot of cash withdrawals, but then all of a sudden they start happening and start happening pretty frequently. We know that something might be going on there, or I might see transfers to an account that you never knew about at mm -hmm. the same bank that you're at, maybe just a new account number at a different bank altogether. Wow. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's like, I like how you kind of mentioned that it's about seeing those different habits. It wasn't like your cleaning person always comes, you always get $80 cash every week. And that's pretty common that you would get that cash and that goes to them. Um, it's like all of a sudden, these extra payments are kind of trickling in um, and different things like that where uh, maybe you didn't realize that before. Right. Going to the ATM every couple of days and taking three or $400 out when there's no real reason that we know about that that should be happening. Or maybe even going directly into a bank branch and withdrawing $3,000. You know, yeah. I like asking the questions. And sometimes I'll ask the question, why was three or $4,000 withdrawn from the account? And the answer is, oh, we were doing a home renovation and we withdrew that money to get a cashier's check because that's what our contractor wanted. Great. If there's a, a legitimate a rhyme and reason, <laughs> fantastic. You know, or someone will say, oh, we withdrew money because we needed a cashier's check to go put a down payment down on a car. Makes sense. But in those cases where there isn't one of those explanations, then of course we get worried and we want to dig further into what's been going on. So if you start realizing your partner has been spending money without really your consent, how are you going to use this to get an even settlement? I mean, because it just seems like they hold the power. It's easy to kind of feel almost discouraged. Where do you even start from there? I mean, you can't just be like, pay me that money back. 
Right. Well, you can just be like, pay me that money back if you can prove what they've been spending money on. So what happens in a lot of cases is someone goes to their divorce attorney and says, I think my husband is hiding money. I think he's been spending it on an affair. I think he's been wasting it on gambling or day trading, things like that. The first thing your attorney is going to say is, what proof do you have of this? right? Because you can't run into court in front of the judge and just say, I know he's doing a thing. They're going to say you need evidence of it. And so that's where we really want to focus. If you know that things are going on, we have to have the evidence. The evidence is what do the bank statements say? What do the investment account statements say? What do the credit card statements say? So it does go back to a process of going through these statements line by line and identifying transactions that are what you're saying to uh, your divorce attorney. So for example, you can go to the bank statements and show that there are repeated withdrawals of money at a casino. And that supports your statement that your husband is gambling away your money. You could add up all of those ATM withdrawals, figure out how much in total. And let's say you come up with $25,000 that was taken out of the ATM at the casino. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a whole lot of luck winning at a casino. And I understand that most people lose. So if he took $25,000 out, that $25,000 is probably gone. If we can prove that in front of the divorce court judge, we can then hopefully get that money back by asking for other assets. So if you have equity in a house that you're dividing, or if there's a retirement account that you're dividing, or if there are other assets that have value, cars, boats, toys, whereas a court might normally kind of look at 50-50 as a starting point for dividing those things, now maybe they're going to look at giving you a larger share of those to make up for that $25,000 that was wasted at the casino. I love that because... We didn't talk about that conversation about you at the casino and you're allowed to spend that much money. Right. Um, that's, a, that's a huge amount. You know, those different things. It's like, I know we didn't have that conversation and I would not have approved of that. Right. Right. And so is it easy to get the money back? No, I'm not trying to tell you that it's easy. There is going to be a process to it. And a judge could look at it and say, no. I mean, your spouse could say, oh, she knew I was going to the casino all the time. In fact, she went with me sometimes and we gambled together. So there are complicating factors and it's not going to be a slam dunk, but you have zero shot of getting that money back if you don't have the evidence. So the first step is Very getting true. the evidence and then making that argument in court. And so, you know, a common thing then is like the breadwinner to be like, well, that's my retirement account. It has Ugh. my name on it. That one's mine. I'm sure Ugh. from that reaction, you get this one a lot. I um, hear it all the time. Mom. I don't have my retirement account, but you have yours and it's nicely funded. Right. So when you as a couple decided that one of you was going to stay home and raise the children and put forth all of that effort, that was a joint decision that was made. I'm sure you didn't make that on your own. You didn't just one day say, I'm having kids and staying home and that's just how it's going to be. As a couple, you made that decision. And I like to think about that when we get married, the money that comes into the household belongs to both of us. So no matter whose name is on that paycheck, that money that's earned belongs to both of us no matter whose name is on that retirement account, that belongs to both of us. At the very least, the part of the retirement account that was earned or established while we were married. And so when your spouse is saying, you're not going to get a penny of my retirement account, it's mine, please don't be scared off by that. Don't believe them. You know what? If you go through the court process and a judge says you don't get any of that, that's a whole different thing. Right? right. There might be reasons. There might be circumstances. There might be some nuances in your state law. Maybe it turns out the retirement account we're talking about is one that your spouse had before you ever got married. That mm -hmm. might be a different scenario. But don't just walk away from these assets because they're scaring you. I often hear that's my house. I was the one who made the money, who made the mortgage payments. You're not getting a penny out of that house. It's just not true. It's just not yeah. how it works unless you have a prenup. And that's, again, one of those different situations. If there's a prenup, we're going to have to follow that. But in most marriages, you know, that marital home belongs to both of us. Yeah. And I feel like there is a lot of that um, verbal, you know, dominance of you're not going to get this, you're not going to get that, which can really scare you, frighten you, make you anxious and kind of make you throw in the towel. And part of that's a great tactic if you're, you know, 
trying to crush the other person down. Um, but, and that's why we're kind of saying, you know, we have to stand up and not throw on the towel, go through this information because that leads for years and years of years of financial good or bad. Right. It's all about knowledge is power for me and mm -hmm. knowledge about the finances will help you stand stronger in getting what you're entitled to in the divorce. And it's true. You get one shot in your divorce to get the correct settlement, to get what you deserve, to get your half, at least your half. I mean, I talk sometimes about, do you know that if you were a stay at home mom and you put your career on hold for 10, 15, 20 years, you might actually get more than half of that retirement account because the judge might look at it and say, I know if you go back to work today, you're never going to catch up to where your husband is earning. He earns a bunch. He's going to be able to save more for retirement going forward than you ever will. So I'm going to give you 70% of that retirement account. It happens, but it can't happen unless we know how much is in that account and unless we ask for it and that we have information, know what we're talking about. So yeah. as you can see, I'm so passionate about fighting for what you deserve because this will impact your ability to retire down the road. It'll impact your ability to pay your bills currently for yourself and your kids, et cetera. 100%, yeah, it's, it's long-term effects and you really can't go back to the court later and readjust the plan. It really is kind of a one and done thing of course, always an asterisk, always certain circumstances. Right. Um, but it's really like a one and done thing. Well, people talk about, you know, reopening their divorces and it is possible. Um, their attorneys sometimes talk about, well, let's just enter into this settlement. We can always go back to court to ask for a modification later. I will tell you those modifications are expensive, time consuming. They are not guaranteed. And it's why I am so interested in having people get the best settlement right up front. I don't ever want you to count on being able to reopen it or being able to get that modification because you just don't know. So let's do the best that we can do now before we are making it final. Reopening it, it reminds me of like going back into surgery. Like we're right. just going to cut open that scar, put you under again and get back to work. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just recovered. Like well, why right. do I have to go back in the operating room? And the expense of it is what really holds people back from being able to do it. Even if you have good legal grounds to reopen it, many times the cost of having an attorney do it is cost prohibitive for people. And they just, yeah. they end up not being able to reopen it because they can't afford to pay the attorney. Yeah, definitely. And then you've written an, an article for Purse Strings re recently about, um, looking at your spouse's 401k because they just might be taking money straight out of there, which as we just recently talked about is really the house money still. Right. So if they have a 401k, they report to you what the balance is. That's all fine and well, but I don't want to take that balance just at face value. I want to get statements. I want to go back in time and see what's been happening with that account because we do see situations where your spouse has, without your knowledge, withdrawn money out of that account. And that needs to be accounted for in the divorce. You know, that money, if anything was taken out, um, half of that was yours. And yeah. we need to account for that. And so um, how far back do you usually go when you're doing this research of, you know, finding the money and things like that? So we typically talk about going back three to five years. And okay. if we went back that far and found some concerning things, we might go back further than that. What becomes a little difficult is if you are trying to get records from a bank or an investment company, they are typically going to tell you that they only have records going back seven years. If you get lucky, they might come up with 10 years worth of stuff. Beyond that, you're probably out of luck. So if you're in a long-term marriage, you've been married for 20 years and you want to go back and look at all this for 20 years, unless you have those statements you know, in your possession already, you're going to be limited to how far you can go back. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there'd be a ton of data to go through if I think mm -hmm. about every debit card and credit card swipe I've ever made. Right. Um, I think it gets a little even messier trying to remember what did we do? Did we go away, you know, one weekend back in 2011 or not? Um, it could be a little harder to understand. It sure can. What I have people do with the divorce money guide is start to put together a timeline of important financial events and work on that timeline 
uh, on an ongoing basis. So start mapping it out. You know, when you bought your house, when you bought a car, when you sold a car, different money moves when someone changed jobs, because that would cause a change in the 401k account, things like that. And we start adding to that timeline as we, as things pop into your mind. And that can be a really valuable way to help you sort through what documents we're going to need, what information we should run down. And so then if there are any accounts that are not being shared with you or not under your name, so you can't get access, how do you bring those up in, you know, either to your financial advisor that you're working with or through your divorce money guide? You know, how are those things kind of found and uh, added to the equation? So if you know there is an account, but your name isn't on it, your attorney can send a subpoena to the bank or the credit card or investment company, and you can get the records. It's a legal process. There's nothing shady about it. Uh, it's very standard to send a subpoena. The bank has to send the documents. And so you'll then see the statements and all those kinds of things. As far as an account that we don't yet know exists, what we are doing is looking through the statements that we do have. So looking through our joint checking account at all of those transactions and seeing, do we see a transfer to an account that we didn't know about? We're looking for clues yeah. uh, to uh, other accounts that could exist. And that's typically how we uncover those secret accounts. Interesting. It mm -hmm. seems like a fun puzzle if it's not your life. Correct. Um, it seems a little bit more enticing and kind of like a game of Clue. Um, but if it is your life, it, I get it. It's much more emotional and much harder to kind of go through and really analyze all those different things. For sure. And so how can the Divorce Money Guide help somebody when they are thinking about going through divorce or going through divorce? So if you have concerns about your family's money and what has been going on with it, or if you just haven't been involved with the money and you now need to get your arms around, what have we been spending money on? Where are these accounts? How much is in them? The Divorce Money Guide is a tool to help someone do that themselves so that they don't have to go pay ten dollars or $15,000 to a forensic accountant to work through the process. And the Divorce Money Guide offers people some videos that they watch, shows them how to get their account statements and their tax returns, and then shows them exactly what to look for in them. Because I will tell you, for most people, probably 95% of people going through divorce, you don't need a forensic accountant. And yeah. if your husband is hiding money, he's probably not all that tricky about it. He probably is assuming that you're never going to look. And so he probably didn't hide it very well. And I can tell you exactly what kind of clues to look for to help uncover that hidden money. What are a couple of clues? I just want a couple. Well, just a couple. So I already mentioned looking for transfers to accounts that True, you didn't know yeah. about before. Um, you can look in your bank statements for that secret credit card. How are you going to find it? Look for a payment to a credit card company that you didn't know about before. Or if there is a credit card company that you know you've been doing business with and you have your family credit card through, but you see two payments in a month to that credit card, it might mean that your husband has a second credit card with that same company. So it's not that complicated. Yeah. There are easy ways to uncover these types of things. Where you'd want to believe they're making double the payments to really pay down that credit card debt. It might just be to another card that's going to uh, somebody else. Yeah. Um, and then it seems like I, you know, we work on figuring out all our finances before getting divorced and figuring out all of that. But then after we're trying to figure out our own budget now that we are single um, and starting our, our life, you know, as one or us and our kids. So do you have any advice there of how to kind of go about that or assess, you know, what that future might look like? For sure. The process of budgeting is so important. And if you don't care for the word budgeting, I like to say put together a spending plan because that sounds a little more fun. If you've gone through your bank statements and your credit card statements, you have a really good idea of how much your expenses cost. You know, what is the mortgage payment every month? How much are you spending usually on groceries or on eating out? What's the car payment? And taking all of those costs and putting them together in a monthly spending plan will help you figure out on an ongoing basis how much does it cost you every month um, to maintain your household and maintain your lifestyle. And so planning like that is going to be really important because you're going to know what you need to be bringing in every month to cover your expenses. 
especially if you're planning to keep the house, what that mortgage looks like, you probably will need to refinance it. But, you know, the insurance on the house and the car payments and all those things, they add up, man, they add up. So you want to make yes. sure you do have enough and it's uh, not all the monies in the walls of the house. That's right. Um, I feel like we touched on a lot of great information. We did. Are, are there any tips or tricks that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure to share today? It was so fast and furious. I think uh, the one thing that I want to say is women in particular tend to be ashamed when it comes to the money in the divorce. They're ashamed because they don't know more about what's been happening or they haven't been keeping an eye on it. And I just want to say that I hope that you can release that feeling of shame. I know that divorce is really emotional and it's really difficult, but there are so many women who are in the same position as you. They trusted their spouse to handle the money. They stayed hands off with it. They were worrying about other things, maybe caring for the kids, maybe managing the household, things like that. And so don't be ashamed that you don't know more about the money. Just take control of it now and start learning, start getting those account statements, start digging through them. And you really can easily get an understanding of what's been going on with the money. Awesome. Yeah. We no more shoulda, coulda, woulda. We're going to jump in right. today, make today here on out the best that we possibly can. Absolutely. Um, so Tracy does have her divorce money guide. Uh, you can check it out on her site. What's your website? Fraudcoach.com. Fraud well, if you, yes, if you go to divorcemoneyguide.com, you're going to get there as well. So I am your fraud coach during divorce. And we've got a lot of resources there to help people feel free. You're seeing my email address uh, on the screen as well. You can feel free to reach out. If you have some questions, we'll do our best to help you out. Yeah. So don't be afraid to reach out, um, you know, get some of this information. Let's jump in and get started um, and make this, you know, the best next chapter of our life. Um, so yeah, Tracy's email is going through the bottom, Tracy at fraudcoach.com. She's also one of our purse strings approved professionals. So you could check her out on our site, purstrings.co. Um, and don't be afraid to share this video with a friend or a loved one if you think they need it as well. Um, so Tracy, thanks again for coming on today and sharing your expertise. And we'll talk to everyone again soon. It was my pleasure. Everyone have a great day. All right, bye.